we'll start with uh, Dr. Carla Pugh. Uh, Professor Pugh's research in, involves the use of simulations and advanced engineering technologies to develop new approaches for assessing mastery and clinical procedural skills. She, she holds three patents uh, on the use of sensor and data acquisition technology to measure and characterize hands-on clinical skills like surgery. And uh, currently over 200 medical and nursing schools are using one of her sensor-enabled tools for their students in training. Uh, and I, it, it's a point of pride that Carla is both uh, MD and she got a PhD with our very own Graduate School of Education. So thank you for being here, Carla, and uh, take it away. Wonderful, thanks for having me. I will uh, share my screen. I'm really looking forward to the uh, discussion and the Q&A. So uh, the title of my talk is Improving Learning in Clinical Medicine Using Wearable Sensor Technology. And we look at ourselves as a group of researchers who provide digital representations of hands-on performance. So this is very much about touch in healthcare. And I think it still surprises a number of people given all the technology that we have in the hospital uh, that we actually still touch our patients. Um, I'm covering trauma today and believe me, it is more efficient for me to observe and touch and feel and ask questions than to send my patient a CT scanner for everything that I think might be a problem. Um, in fact, touch helps us guide which CT scan we should get or x-ray. Um, and I think stepping back, it's not only physical exam, um, but we use our hands in the operating room to touch organs directly and indirectly. Sorry for the gory picture. If there's any surgeons in the audience who are looking at this, you're like, oh my goodness, that catheter went straight through the colon and you're having all these thoughts, you know? But we use our hands in the, in the operating room. And a lot of people talk about robotic surgery. You can't do robotic surgery without using your hands. So it's very much a, 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 a fluid relationship between the surgeon and the robot, even in that high tech combination. The fun thing about it is that there actually really is a science of touch. And two researchers um, from Carnegie Mellon uh, in uh, Queen's University partnered together, and they've really done some of the groundbreaking work with respect to touch. And uh, in addition to all of their hundreds of papers that they've written over the past 30 years in, in high impact journals, this is one of their most notable uh, contributions to haptics, the science of touch. They really un folded what it is that we do when we are gathering information with our hands. Think about it. From physicians to athletes to truck drivers to typing to feeding yourself, they study infants through elderly senior persons. They use blindfolds, no blindfolds. And it turns out that in any given situation, when you're trying to gather information with your hands or operate machinery or tools, the human computer interface, all of the above, you are making consciously and unconsciously one of these six maneuvers combined together. And this really helped us to understand um, our data as we embarked on quantifying and digitizing uh, touch. What's been exciting for us is to combine these two worlds, haptics and metrics. And our goal really is to quantify the learning curve to mastery, use that as criterion, and really just a language of information exchange. These are some of the sensors we've explored over the past 15 years. Uh, many of you may recognize some of these FSR, force sensing resistors, motion uh, sensors, um, a variety of sensors uh, in collaboration with our engineering and uh, colleagues. And within healthcare, what we've done is take some of the simulated clinical scenarios, in this case, a clinical breast exam. Sometimes we buy the models off the shelf. Sometimes we reverse engineer and fabricate them ourselves and we place a variety of different types of sensors. This is one of the paper thin uh, sensor wafers. It's actually one of the larger ones. Um, and I'll show you a few others but we combine them uh, with the computer interface. And this is what a clinical breast exam looks like in terms of the amount of 
pressure or force applied over time and within each of the different quadrants of the breast. Each of the different colors represent a different area of the anatomy. And this is not in our current textbooks, but it actually, as I'll show you, turns out to actually be really important when you're teaching someone how to do a proper breast exam. This is one of our other sensors here. Instead of using a, a, a larger paper thin wafer for the breast exam, we were able to use a, a sensor matrix, if you will, um, where the actual sensors are much smaller than the human fingertips. So we weren't missing any data. And you can see the data instead of being projected in terms of um, a line graph of force over time, you can actually see a heat map of the exam. And what you're looking at here is the sensor map on the left side here, and then two family practitioners with 20 years experience doing an exam on a simulated patient that has a two centimeter breast mass near the chest wall. On the video, you can see there's some differences in their technique, but human beings visually aren't able to quantify force. And it turns out that force does matter. Turns out both of these clinicians, you can see it, are pressing the mass against the chest wall and at times you see it light up here. One person said there was no mass because they actually didn't apply enough pressure to discern there was a mass. They touched it several times because we could see them touching it. Um, and the other person uh, noted that there was a mass. We ended up doing a study um, with over 550 practicing clinicians uh, around the country in different specialties, surgery, OBGYN, and family practice. And in that study, um, we use four different clinical scenarios, two of them with different chest wall lesions, one that was really rock hard and another one that was kind of rubbery. And it turns out that there is a linear relationship between force and accuracy. Um, there's a sweet spot of around five to 10 newtons. Beyond 10 newtons, um, increasing force does not give you an increase in accuracy, but it does turn out that about 15% of practicing clinicians don't apply enough force to do a breast exam. What was more interesting, uh, and I'll show you the other, this one, not only does force matter, but what you do with your fingertips matters. And um, you can see they're all using a different technique in terms of how they cover the breast, but they're also doing different techniques with their fingers. And it turns out if you use the piano fingers technique, then you're four times less likely to find the lesion when you're searching the breast. I will pause there because what we, are, what we learned is this is really an issue of information exchange. Many of the physicians perfected what they were taught in terms of how to do the exam, but we had never studied the exam in terms of accuracy and efficiency and compared them using technology. So many of these people spent 20 years perfecting an inaccurate or inefficient uh, technique. And we've repeated this with a number of different uh, medical procedures this one is with intubation. We put sensors on a mannequin in a number of different places. Uh, intubation is where you place a tube into the airway and you um, use a breathing machine to breathe for someone, either because they have lost their ability to breathe or we have actually put them under general anesthesia and paralyzed them so they can't breathe and we have to breathe for them. Um, we also put sensors where we don't want the tube to go, which is in the esophagus, which then if you pump air that goes to your stomach, and that's not uh, a good situation. This is an intubation with the, in terms of the amount of force over time. Uh, the different colors represent a different um, areas of the anatomy and the airway. And by all purposes, um, this is a successful intubation, as you can see, where the breathing tube passes the vocal cords. Um, here, this shows the amount of force of the laryngoscope, that tube um, with the light source that helps you see in the airway. And you can tell this person, you know, did a number of manipulations looking uh, to see, get a good view of the airway before passing the tube. Um, this is successful, but this is what an experienced intubation looks like. Think about our scenario in healthcare, and I'll show you one example be before I um, really make some of my finishing points. The gold standard is to give verbal feedback. We train by human observation and we give verbal feedback, and we take those who are the best physicians in terms of their outcomes and the students 
spend a lot of time with us, hoping that, you know, with our feedback and our observation that our skills will rub off on them and they will make good decisions. It turns out that obviously if force uh, matters and human beings are good with observing force, some, a few tips and tricks and pearls get lost in translation. Um, and so there, there is a huge opportunity um, for technology to, to contribute um, to the teaching excellence that already exists in healthcare. Similar with the thyroid exam, and I'll show you this example only to show that what we're learning along the way is that every medical procedure has a force profile signature. Uh, looks like a bunch of squiggly lines here in terms of an intubation, but the two sensors, um, here is the one on the laryngoscope and here is the one on the vocal cords. Um, there's this pattern when you have good control of the airway. This person didn't have good control. They were still manipulating and then forced the tube in. Here for a thyroid exam, looks very different. Um, force over time, same thing. The different colors represent a different area of the anatomy. With a thyroid exam here, this first part, the practitioner is putting their fingers on your neck to find the anatomy. And then once they're there, then they pr apply more pressure. First, to, you know, and people do left or right first, but this person applied more pressure on the left side and they ask you to swallow. And then they're able to feel the movement of the anatomy in that place and see if there's any tumors or anything overlying the, the mobile parts. And then they relax on that side and then press harder on the other side. There is a signature and this is just amazing for us. This is, this is uh, new findings for us in healthcare. It's encouraged us. We are now exploring a wider variety of sensors. In one study we did audio capture, video capture, EEG sensors, and motion tracking, different than force movement um, sensors. And these are all synchronized data streams. And this has really helped us um, understand not only the technical aspects, but how people talk, how they do teamwork, how they guide their team, how they teach, um, and cognitive load with, with EEG capture. So we are learning a lot um, about this in terms of the learning curve to mastery. Um, there is a lot of decisions that are made. There is a visual haptic loop. What we do in an operation in terms of cutting and moving organs around, we may have a plan from A through Z, but when the anatomy changes, we do have to have a plan B and C in terms of the different um, decisions uh, as we progress through our procedure. And so there are a lot of decisions that are made before action takes place. And this technology combining haptics um, with sensor technology, whether it's motion tracking or force, gives us a new language and we're able to move beyond um, just listening and observing humans, but also adding this layer of data and again, I just want to underscore, we're dealing with adult learners and they're surgeons and, you know, well-trained and they are, they're very, um, you know, proud of what they've learned thus far. And so sometimes teaching them, you have to get them, uh, situate them at a point of learning and sometimes verbal, verbally, um, maybe missing a few of those details. This is an example of someone who, I, we said novice, not tying motion, but this is someone who's uh, gone through 15 years of medical training and they're now learning how to do microscopic surgery and to give them feedback of the consequences of something simple, not cutting their sutures short enough when they're tying. I can verbally give them a lecture of how this affects their efficiency and their working volume, but to show them the picture, the difference between they're not tying and an expert. Now they actually have a visual towards what they can work, a visual um, criteria and performance, what they can work towards. Um, I think that a lot of people say, well, you know, this is great and fabulous research, but do doctors really want to be tested? For the past 20 years, it doesn't matter what conference we go to, what procedure we're simulating, they line up by the hundreds. People want the information they come here on the first day of the conference. They let us put sensors on them, their tools, the mannequin. They do the procedures. We collect the data. They come back the next day and they have the, the, the qualitative research around the conversation that these people are having here is something we never experienced in the hospital without this technology. And that's what's really exciting. Um, we are still in the beginning phases of translating this work from a simulated environment to the hospital environment. 
Uh, but I say that uh, people are very excited. There is a, a, a um, group of early adopters, um, a significant portion of, of physicians uh, that understand the utility of this, not only for their own clinical practice, but for teaching and training and setting the bar at a much higher level and shortening the learning curve. So what we're really after is everyday use of this technology to improve information exchange and learning. And uh, we're very excited with the opportunities that we've had to partner um, with national organizations um, and uh, that guide uh, medicine and, and are the rule makers in terms of credentialing um, and assessment. And uh, we're having lots of fun uh, with this type of work. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Carla. Uh, it's kind of mind blowing. You know, it's such a new way of thinking about technology. I'm trying to figure out, could I teach math using haptics? And so I have a quick question uh, before we go to Nick. Uh, about 20 years ago, people were working on haptics in surgery. And they were telling me that the, the, the medical society would not accept training through simulations, that they felt it had to be on real cadavers. Is, is that changing? Because you can imagine a simulation would actually be better for lots and lots of reasons. But it, is that changing where people are beginning to accept these simulated experiences as authentic assessments and instruction? It is still more common to use simulation with medical students and residents than practicing clinicians. However, the technology behind the development of simulations has improved dramatically over the past 20 years. No longer just the stiff mannequins, but a um, wide variety of 3D printed organs um, where you can situate a surgeon with CD, CT specific human anatomy and disease. And so the simulations have gotten much better and there's much broader adoption at the practicing experienced surgeon level because we can get, we can 3D print that congenital defect for you know, hundreds of surgeons where with a cadaver, you get one you know, patient because it's a rare disease. So, so 3D printing has really helped simulation, another, you know, technology, helping technology, if you will. And combining that with this sensor technology has really uh, changed the, the face of our ability to do information exchange and share tips and tricks, what, what practicing surgeons and the experts really are doing. That's fabulous. That's fabulous. Okay, thank you. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Nick Haber. He's a professor at the Graduate School of Education. He's the co-founder of the Autism Glass Project at Stanford. This is a research effort that employs wearable technology and computer vision in a tool for children who are on the spectrum. He and his research group also developed uh, artificial intelligence systems meant to mimic the ways people learn early in life and explore their environments through play social interaction and curiosity. And maybe if we can understand, we can make a machine that learns, we can make kids who learn better as well. So Nick, take it away. All right, um, thank you so much. So re really excited to be part of this today. And I, I look forward to continuing these conversations, fingers crossed in, in person soon even. Um, so let me start off by making a claim that hopefully is not particularly controversial. We learn through interaction with our worlds and others. Well, let me say a little bit more precisely what I mean by that. I'd, I'd like to have you imagine yourself as well a, a toddler. Um, so around this toddler you are, are a wide range of things you can play with and interact and learn from. Some like these blocks you can interact with by grabbing, uh, whacking around, throwing. And, and toddler you being ever curious does all these things. And in doing so, you learn about these blocks, how to manipulate them, how to construct things out of them, how they'll behave if they collide or fall. Um, if you, if toddler you looks up, you might see something very different. See, these, this ceiling fan is dynamic. It moves in a regular pattern. You might realize that you can flip a switch and turn it on or off. Um, if you can somehow get close enough to it, you might try to cause quite a stir bite by trying to touch it. Not a particularly good idea. But largely, you just watch it. And what initially might seem mesmerizing eventually becomes quite predictable. 
looking out a window, you might see leaves rustling in the wind. These are really mesmerizing in that no matter how much you look at them, you can't entirely predict what they're going to do. They're quite chaotic. What you can do is try to grab them, but then the random motion magic ends. Somewhere in all these confusing dynamics are a really important class of stimuli, animate social stimuli. These behave with considerable unpredictability, but also considerable regularity. They have goals, affect, internal states. Moreover, incredibly, our action seems to, seems to affect how they act in, in really subtle ways. And the skill with which we comprehend these mysterious others in our lives determines so much. This understanding is the basis by which we learn from others, cooperate, collaborate, compete, etc. In sum, we learn by interacting with our environments and the people within them. This action that we take, that is what we look at, what we manipulate, how we act towards others, affects what we experience. And in turn, with this experience, we build mental models of our environments and other people. These models are keys to navigating and learning more about our world. And early in our lives, we're relentlessly curious about our surroundings. We play and explore constantly obsessively with our physical worlds, looking for novelty, irregularity, and at least we hypothesize basically trying to optimize to physically understand the world. So much so that we've been called scientists in the crib. And a lot of our interactive learning early in life is social. If you've spent any time recently with a young child, you know that an enormous amount of their attention and energy is focused on others. Sometimes to try to get at some instrumental need like food or warmth or physical touch, other times really just to play to understand the other. Take for instance, the, the game of peekaboo. I bet you've not really played it in a while, but it's really a, a quite complex behavior. These dramatic contingencies between the parent and the child as they hide themselves, show themselves and react. Yet not everybody learns through interaction the same way. So meet David, the cousin of a colleague of mine. Like an estimated one in 59 children, he is on the autism spectrum. Many on the autism spectrum starting very early in life do things differently. They look at faces less, starting perhaps uh, two to six months of age. They engage in play, both physical and social play, differently. And like many of them, David is different in how he navigates the world of affect, emotions. Affect is incredibly complex, right? We look at faces, we recognize certain patterns in them, we interpret, we contextualize in a broader social interaction, and we respond. David has trouble with this process. Illustrated here is the true story of how his family would practice with him in a bathroom mirror. We wondered, could we somehow augment David's learning by emulating this process, at least a bit of how we navigate it, in a wearable artificial device? And so we began what ended up being called the Autism Glass Project. It uses Google Glass and is powered by artificial intelligence. Since a one-on-one -on -one demo here is a bit of a toughie these days, let me just tell you a little bit about what the prototype does. So you put the Google Glass on and it's been stripped of all its usual software. So if you're away from people, it does nothing. But here's your friend, Peter. As soon as he comes in front of you, the outside light prism lights up in a green box. Under the hood, face detection is constantly looking to see if people are in front of it. Then since Peter's smiling, it tells you so. Using a face tracker and facial expression recognition, it automatically provides feedback. And our question here was really, could this serve as a home therapy delivery system that could teach affect navigation and more broadly provide a sort of scaffolding for socialization? A learning tool that builds skills, enabling all sorts of ways, and then when you take it off for good, you have these skills. To validate this idea, we ran a sequence of three studies. The first, an in-lab feasibility study, was largely qualitative. We wanted to understand simply when we gave them this sort of device, a child with autism, when we give them this feedback, what did they do? What did they look at? How did they respond? Armed with this, we then designed a fully working prototype, sent it home to families of kids with autism, saw what happened, made some measurements, altered the device, and so on, over and over again over a period of about over a year. This also gave us a sense of how the device might be helping. So I'll, I'll read this, this along with you. We already noticed something very dramatic I'd like to share. Participant is looking at us when he talks through Google Glasses during a conversation, and it was noticed without glasses from his teacher in language art yesterday. It's almost like a switch was turned. Thank you, my son is looking into my face. Obviously very encouraging, and, and along with it, some, some uncontrolled collection of behavioral measures gave us some sense of what we were doing. But then we decided to validate with a controlled study. 
Now, recall that one of the ways we thought we might be helping is broadly to improve socialization, to provide some building blocks from which all sorts of learning occurs. And indeed, on a measure of this, we found a significant effect. Yet, another way we might be helping was directly on affect navigation. And specifically on this, we barely move the needle. So from one perspective, these are promising pilot results, which need to be strengthened with a larger scale of trial. To do this, we've licensed the technology to a company that's working with the FDA currently to run the next stage. From a scientific perspective, though, results like this suggest that we have a good deal more work to do. How is this device helping? How do we measure how it's helping? So where to from here? Let's zoom out for a second. Well, what have we done? We've taken a human behavior, this attending to faces, interpreting, contextualizing, responding one that I described at the very beginning, and it tried to, in a sense, mimic it in a wearable device, to take some engineered version of a piece of our cognition and design a tool that augments people's learning with a machine version of this piece of cognition, making a sort of learning tool for children with autism. But as I said, while the results were promising, we have a lot of work to do, namely a, a couple of big questions I'd like to identify. How do we better measure and understand how devices like these help? And how do we build better such devices? In particular, how do we build devices that adapt to their surroundings to the individual needs of others to personalize? Well, the answer to me seems simple. We need to embrace a, a certain loop, that in which a fine-grained understanding of this learning process early in life informs a more faithful artificial system. And in turn, this AI understanding gives us a more precise understanding of this early learning process. It's really part of a more general principle in which we let human learning through interaction tell us how to build better artificial intelligence. And in turn, by building artificial intelligence that learns more like we do, we hope to study and aid human learning. My group works on a number of things aimed at embracing this sort of loop, using and innovating on modern techniques in computer vision and deep reinforcement learning. In the remaining time, I'd like to tell you a little bit of how we're doing this with some example projects. You recall at the beginning this spectrum of different sorts of stimuli. I didn't quite give them names, but static ones, periodic ones, randomly moving ones, animated ones. We wondered how do humans decide what to look at in order to learn? Well, we distilled these sorts of stimuli down to these kinematic essentials that would be novel for people to look at. And we've been studying how people are curious in these contexts. We just ask adults to look at the scene and we track their gaze. So, uh, what you're seeing here is is the uh, is a purple dot for the person's gaze. And so I'll play the video here. Um, the balls are what are called spheros. They're these little robots that have gyroscopic motors inside and allow us to program these in these kinematic ways. So the red one is staying still. That's that's the static stimulus. The the lower right, the the yellow one is moving around in a regular circle. It's periodic. The um, blue one at the at the top left is uh, jittering about. Um, in a somewhat random manner. And the green one is doing something interesting. So, so when you uh, look away from it, it, it moves away out of the box, uh, out from behind the box. And then, and then when you um, uh, look at it, it darts back behind again. So it's, it's in essence, it's playing peekaboo with you. It's the, it's the animate stimulus. And so we just want to understand what people would look at when they were given these sorts of novel scenes. That was on a non-clinic population of adults. And we really wanted to understand how children do it, and in particular, how children with ASD do it differently. To facilitate this in the pandemic, we've moved to augmented reality. What I'm showing you here is an AR app that instantiates these Sphero-type stimuli and allows kids to explore them in their own homes. We can deploy this to children, and so long as they have an iPhone, we, we, can, collect, we can collect data of what they pay attention to. So we've been collecting data from the from both typically developing children and ASD children since the spring, working down to 46 years of age. And we're trying to mirror this building block of interactive learning, deciding what to look at by engineering and artificial systems. Here's a virtual environment with the corresponding stimuli, people's sphere is moving about, in which our artificial agent, the, um, the little white robot in the middle, um, learns. So right, our guiding question here is, how do we engineer systems that decide what to look at in their environments in order to learn? These engineered systems, through nothing other than some measure of curiosity, preferentially attend to the animate stimuli. They'll even, again, simply through curiosity, 
play peekaboo with the other agent, learning how to interact with them in order to learn more. But deciding where to attend is only one building block of social learning. And we're looking at going considerably beyond this. We're, we're looking, for instance, to build artificial systems that can learn skills from experts by curiosity-driven interaction. We're working on making artificial systems that in trying to help you perform some task can adapt to your style and cooperate with you. Pictured here is the uh, overcooked environment where you, uh, in a virtual environment, cook a meal with someone else. And we're working on making artificial agents that increasingly engage in sophisticated social play behavior simply by being curious around their world and their play partners. Pictured here is a, uh, the, the dark blue parent agent and the light blue child agent, and they learn how to play catch simply by curiosity. So engineering artificial social learning is aimed in part at better understanding how we learn through interaction with each other, but it's not just that. And I'll leave you with one last question. With AI that learns and interacts socially as we do, what better devices and learning tools can we create? Thanks. Thank you, Nick. Uh, uh, as always, it's uh, it's mind blowing to see what you're able to do. So, what's your answer to the question? Your final question? Oh, what's the answer? <laughs> so, question, question, question. Oh, right, I just asked the question. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean. You know, I think I think very broadly, you know, if, if we can, it, there's something very interesting about being able to make artificial intelligence that's that's adaptive to to individuals, and and you know, often in learning contexts, we're making systems that are learning from us as we're learning from them, um, and they they in essence need to be in really to make make like powerful interactive systems from which you can learn. Um, but you know, those of you who you know, if, if you play with, I don't know smartphones, right? They, they learn they learn particular behaviors of like autocorrect or what sorts of songs that we like and so on. These are these are they're designing models that are fitting to us, but or fine tuning models that are fitting to us. But they're um, they're very far cry away from you know what we might call social interaction with the device. And if we can create devices that start to be able to mentalize about the user, about the other, um, we can go a lot farther. And imagine being able to learn with a device basically by having a conversation with it um, and it is able to understand your your goals your needs what you know and what you don't know in a way that a person does um, taking that piece of cognition and putting it in these systems i think is, is really interesting very good okay uh so uh audience you can submit questions via the google form on the transforming learning accelerator website uh, we have a couple, but while I give you a chance to type some in, let, let me ask a general question of Carla and Nick, which is much more speculative. Um, so something that's striking about both, both of your lines of work is the degree to which people are interacting with a physical world, a physical or social world, actually. But Carla was also emphasizing that. When I think of, when a lot of people think of advanced technologies in education, they think of people learning symbolic things like math, like reading, right? And here you are going after these things that are deeply situated, physical, your body's involved. Uh, is, this, is, this, uh, is it a coincidence? Is it just a chance or is it like, no, something new has opened up that we really couldn't address before? So it's a really speculative question, but, but you guys are the world's experts. So your speculations are worth a lot. Wow, I love that question because I, I live in such a physical world, but I ironically, when I, when I think about math and I think about reading, I actually think about how I integrate that into my physical work place and my workflow on a daily basis. Um, you know, you, a lot of us do reading on our cell phones now, but you're touching your phone and how do you scroll and like, so, so for me, if I was going to do the research, I, I can already see, like, if I've got sensors on a cell phone and someone or, or a Kindle, however, if you're reading a book, what parts of the book do you pass through quickly? Where, where do you pause? And I think it sort of, you know, maps in a similar way to, to Nick's work that helps you understand, 
I think it comes down to understanding human thoughts and behavior with respect to a value. Like how, how do you value your daily experiences? Because where there's value, when we all have, we all have subconscious place value subconsciously on, on certain experiences. One, you know, you, you have to learn this thing because it's important to this place you want to go, or it's important for you to communicate to this person. But I, I think for me, if I had to link it all, it would, it would be a value metric uh, in terms of our human existence and self-awareness. Um, I don't know. I think that sets you up, Nick, to, to bring it home. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, the value the value is locating yourself in the world around you yes how's that that's and it's important we don't yeah. talk about it a lot we don't have a framework for talking about it but we're constantly doing it every day yeah very good very good nick you want to take a shot yeah 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 C certainly and, and um you know it was interesting it's interesting that you bring this up i you know i actually just this morning I was talking with a student about like okay well what if we what if we just captured every single pen stroke all where we have, you know, 10,000 kids solve math problems? I hypothesize certainly that we could use the same sorts of overall ideas to try to attack those sorts of data. I'd love to see what 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 Carla does with that. Um, and and you know, I would certainly love to have a crack at the, that that sort of thing. Um, uh, you know, and and I and you know, another example have a student um, in the project didn't mention um, playing with uh, cell phone data, how people use um, cell phone devices. And you can imagine very similarly, that it's a very different sort of embodiment. We, we kind of tap these screens and, and, uh, um, and that allows us to do all sorts of things, explore that world. And we can, we can capture that data, make artificial systems that can, you know, surf the web, can, can uh, browse Instagram. Um, and and, uh, and and try to understand it similarly that way. Um, I think that you know we started with embodied contexts for a for a, a, a couple of reasons. Um, one basically being I think you know this sort of situating self in the world very a very powerful thing, very important cognitive process. Um, and and moreover, just you know there are, there are a lot of very strong developmental signals for how this learning process happens. A lot of things that we can grab onto. So in a sense, it sort of makes sense. Okay, babies are very good at exploring their physical world. Just all sorts of behaviors that we we understand things about. This is a a good first place for us to understand um, how play behavior works. Okay, so uh, so I'm, I'm my my bet for AI and education is that it's really going to play well on the perceptual motor data. This, it's incredibly rich. It's a huge part of our existence. Uh, it's very hard for teachers to follow that. You know, you need like your expert tennis coach. And so this is a, a place where, anyway, that, that's my prediction. So here's a question for you two. Uh, you, you're both uh, capturing huge quantities of data with your technology, you know, and in the midst of trying to help people, you're also collecting all this data. Do you run into questions of privacy? Or are your two areas sort of sequestered off from the general question? So China, there's a product that's selling quite well in China, which is a lamp that has two cameras on the kid while they're doing their homework. And that information is getting fed back to, you know, central that's making decisions about the kid. And, you know, people start to worry about, are you collecting too much information? Are you invading privacy? So have either of you run into this in your work yet? Oh, wow. I, I mean, it's huge for, for us, right? Because uh, to situate yourself in, in the, the field of healthcare, um, data about physician performance uh, is huge. Uh, everybody wants it because everybody wants the best physician. Um, the healthcare system and the medical schools um, have to have a standard and are realizing more and more that the pencil and paper test is actually not good enough for you know knowing you know holistically whether your physician is, is good or not. So uh, 
our measurement culture right now um, has a huge opportunity to be <laughs> moved forward. Uh, in, in my language, I would say it needs to be resuscitated. <laughs> um, it's punitive. Uh, and we tend to, to, to only use summative assessment, uh, high stakes. Either you get to practice your craft or you don't, it's, it's your certification. And so the thought of using data, AI, efficient data that characterizes, but to use it for formative assessment and learning is um, we're going to have to fight for it. The physicians want it. But the system is not set up to comprehend that. And there's never been a conference that I've attended where at the end of all the excitement and how do we use this and how do we integrate it, there's one or two people that say, oh, so when can we use it for credentialing? And I'm like, <laughs> so the, the, the laws don't protect the physicians in, in being able to, to use this data without it being discovered legally. Uh, we have this thing called the uh, malpractice and uh, insurers. And, and uh, so the, it's, a, it's a really big deal. And that's why partnering with um, the American College of Surgeons, American Board of Surgery, uh, the, the, the institutions in this nation that govern assessment and data, um, we learned that er early on that is very important. Uh, interesting. Yeah. 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 You got one for this? And certainly, yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, I've not dealt with these these particular sorts of structures in the medical community that that uh, make this, you know, particularly challenging. I think that, I mean, you know, that we do work with clinical populations, um, you know, right in, in the Autism Glass Project, we were capturing egocentric video data, right? These They were wearing these devices and we record everything. When they turn in a session, that's video data. We, we get, um, you know, we get as they're as they're recording it. And, and that's um, in the context of this study, um, we did certain things to try to ameliorate it. Like even though we really like to have audio, we didn't include audio. Um, so as to, to um, make them feel more comfortable, we allowed them to um, delete videos. They deleted a lot of videos. Um, and uh, um, you know, and I think that in, in a context of this study, a certain amount of altruism really outweighed things. They wanted to contribute and make this better device. But there's a really big question if it's these sorts of wearable learning tools, which you can capture these interesting data. Well, you know, what, how, do you, how do you make people comfortable? How do you protect them? I think that these are big outstanding, um, and big outstanding questions. And another example being this like, all right, this collaboration they have with um, uh, Neil and Ram Communications and the Screenomics group, like they they're they they are having people install an app where every five seconds it takes a screenshot of your phone. Can you imagine that? Um, and only a very like right like okay, you know, not everybody is going to do that. And how and how do you protect that like extremely sensitive data? That's um, and that you know I think again a certain sort of altruism comes with people wanting to enroll into the study, but. You know, on the other hand, I, I think it's a big thing to grapple. So By Byron Reeves, who's a professor of communications, ran a study where he got the undergraduates to agree to let him take a, I believe it was every second, they take a screenshot of their computer while they're working on it. And uh, the findings were slightly horrifying for those who are older, is that the speed with which they switch between tasks, you know, is the average amount of time on any given task was about four seconds. And... Uh, and now, now he's developed a theory about why that's a good thing, so as opposed. But anyway, uh, there was a factual question for you, Nick, uh, kind of about dosing. Do you know like uh, how long uh, kids wear these glasses, and do they need to wear them all the time? Uh, is what do do you have a vision for an ultimate application? For this? It's a great it's a great question. Um, I, so. We in our in our first iteration of this, the limiting factor was really engagement, getting people to use these sorts of devices consistently. And this was and so you know we, we what we decided on from some basic interaction with with some people in a very in a very fluid way was um, you know three times a week, twenty minutes a day, um, and then once in addition with the with a practitioner, um, twenty minutes a day, so four times total, and um, and that would be for six weeks. So now it's just based on, okay, how long can we get them to engage? 
um, without sort of drastically falling off in, in, in their adherence to that. Um, and we did find we did find an effect at that level. Both, you know, we did, we did a six week measure, and then they took the device off, and um, in follow up, the, the the effect was was still there. Um, my my hunch is that we're getting some learning effect that they that sticks with them, but it probably falls off a bit. Um, so that was our current thinking with dosing. But I mean, I think this is in a kind of larger context of how do you make these things um, engaging? Uh, how, how do you make people uh, ad adhere to them for, for considerable periods of, of time? Um, and the goal certainly is to produce a learning effect. They can take yeah. these things off. Yeah. But so you, do you like try and gamify what shows up on the glass? For example, you know, you, put, you have the parents intentionally make faces and the kid tries to guess the emotion before it tells him things like that. Yeah, that, right. Exactly. There were a few games. There's like, a, 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 there's exactly what you're saying. Like, I guess the emotion game we, uh, we had, there was a free form, uh, game. You could just do whatever you wanted. Really. There was, um, cap, what we called capture the smile. And this was, this was borrowed out of, uh, Roz Picard's group who did some work on this and, uh, uh, you know, a number of years ago where, where they, Kids would run around and try to provoke emotions in people by, like, you know, saying something really gross and then, you know, and then like, <laughs> disgusting face. So, um, and and you know, we saw like younger kids really like that. Some older kids like yes, the emotion thing as they got older, free form. These are very limited, though, obviously, and and you can imagine um, furthering engagement with with like much more sophisticated means than that. Very good. So this is the last question, and it's kind of the same question for you, Carla. What what is the you, you've both created tools that are able to detect a lot of stuff. And conceivably, you can just feed that information back to people. But you probably want a teacher in the loop or some equivalent to that. So what is the role of the teacher in your haptics environment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I don't think that this uh, data that we're outputting eliminates the teacher in any way whatsoever. Um, it changes the role um, in some instances, uh, just in terms of you know time spent. I think that uh, right now the data really is giving you know what the outcome is of your actions and then putting you in a learning moment where you can, before someone's trying to tell you you're doing this and it's costing you a lot, you can't calculate, you can't see it. You look at that graph and you look, oh my goodness, okay, I've got work to do. That's where the teacher comes in. So the, so the technology gives you a diagnosis that the teacher can say, okay, here's a few things that you can do and then demonstrate that. Um, and so two ways, uh, you know, similar framework where we're getting teachers to record um, their movements and show on a video they answer to that problem. Um, and so we can build that into the software system that there's AI coaching, if you will, but it's really, you know, AI assigning that 10 second teaching clip. And then there's, you know, other things that are a lot more complex where you, where you really need a coach. Um, and, and it's not a rule-based error, error that can easily be corrected just by looking at yourself and someone else. But there's some other things involved that are more complex. So I think teachers will be assigned to more complex issues that AI can't figure out yet. Interesting. So, so the AI is going to augment, but not replace. Yes. Yeah. So I, I want to thank you both. Uh, there's, uh, uh, Carla, do you have a website that has your publications? Somebody asked for your research on trachea exams. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can actually just type in, in Google Carla Pugh and intubation. And I, there's at least two papers on the intubation. Um, but yes, our website, uh, I am the director of the Technology Enabled Clinical Improvement Center, TECI, T-E-C-I. So you can just type in Carla Pugh and TECI and Google and, and all of our research and work and grants and papers will come up. Okay. So thank you, Carla. Thank you, Nick. Um, Again, it just opens our imagination to things we would have never thought about. And suddenly we have to figure out how can we take advantage of these possibilities.